A few years ago, I visited India for the first time, and I was the only member of our group who didn't bring a camera. Why did I leave my camera at home? Because I didn't want to be in a place I'd never seen before, looking at everything through a viewfinder. As the word viewfinder suggests, a camera is often what creates a traveler's perspective, focusing, framing, and filtering the world. In a way, travelers who take photographs give up a bit of their autonomy, since it's the camera that determines the look of whatever they observe, landscapes, people, and historic sites. A camera can also distance travelers from what they have come to see. When tourists in India walk alongside the stretch of a maidan or into a packed, redolent spice market with a camera pressed against their faces, that camera separates them from the local people and places they've come to see, from scenes that disquiet or confuse or delight. The camera becomes a literal barrier between the world and that part of the body most closely associated with the soul, the human eye. The camera can also become a psychological barrier. When snapping pictures, it's possible to argue that the photographer controls and owns the view. Susan Sontag, the well-known essayist and cultural critic, critic, points out in her book on photography that the verbs of picture-taking are mostly borrowed from hunting and war. Tourists load a camera and they aim it. They shoot or take a picture, and in this way, they capture their moment. So a camera is assertive, even aggressive, which means it can simultaneously boost someone's confidence while separating him or her from the world beyond the frame. Even though I didn't carry a camera with me during my weeks in India, that doesn't mean that I didn't want to remember what happened to me, what I experienced and learned from my trip. I brought along a journal and I wrote in it every day. I recorded what I saw, but also what I felt, smelled, heard, and tasted. According to my journal, some of what I saw was this. A cityscape cut out from the same drab cloth, everything packed closely together, rinsed in rainy day gray. I saw broken buildings and dented cars, shelters made out of boxes, pottery and plastic and glass scattered and strewn across the ground. I saw a man much too old for physical labor working a bicycle rickshaw, and a girl much too young for sex offering her body to passers-by. In the middle of the sidewalk, I walked past a body wrapped in a blanket that may have been its warmth or its shroud. I saw a girl with a missing arm, a man with twisted feet, and many young mothers holding babies against their chests, begging for money, moving hands to their mouth over and over again, eating air. Taken all together, I saw such pain and hunger and loss that I felt sick with it, sick with my sense of sight. And each night, I returned to my room, and I cried, my eyes trying to shed what I'd asked them to bear. Yet it would be misleading to suggest that all I saw was ugliness and suffering. I also experienced great beauty in India, and often this beauty arrived not through my sense of sight, but through my senses of touch and taste and sound. In Old Delhi, at one of the largest mosques in India, the swish, swish of soft feet sounded like women whispering. The same sound grew more insistent at the Taj Mahal, where hundreds of visitors took off their shoes to slipper across the white marble. On a sprawling maidan in Kolkata, the satisfying crack of wooden bats and the full-throated laughs of boys playing cricket were sounds both immediate and alive. In Lucknow, the honeyed taste of almond paste in puri, a kind of puffed bread fried in oil, was the very heart of sweetness, and a cup of masala chai was rich and spiced. As I watched pilgrims bathe in the Ganges, my chai radiated warmth. Finally, in a bathroom at the National History Museum in Mumbai, a woman put her finger on my forehead as she pressed a bindi against it and said, For friendship. It was a weight both strange and kind, the most intimate moment of my trip. Because I have no photographs of these people and places, I have no way to remember them with the precision that comes from pictures. 
I can't recall what the cricket players were wearing or whether the Ganges was dark or clear. And yet it's also true that photographs offer but a partial window to recollection. Even if I had snapped photographs, they would only preserve slices of time. Photographs wouldn't be faithful to how my moments were dynamic and liquid, instead of static and fixed. And whether a person recalls an experience through photographs or through words, that memory evolves over time. So the way that images or the words are interpreted also changes as well. What matters most for an essayist, which is what you and I are here to talk about, of course, aren't the facts of a person's memory, but what I would call the truth of it. As the Nobel Prize-winning novelist Toni Morrison says, facts can exist without human intelligence, but truth cannot. What she means is that even if there were no people around to interpret them, facts would still exist. The American Civil War would still have started on April 12, 1861, and the chemical formula for water would still be two hydrogen atoms bonded with a single one of oxygen. When people compare and contrast facts, or when they string facts together to create a larger context, what they come to understand are wider human truths. These are the reasons why the Civil War began, or how and why water is fundamental to all forms of life. Through the notes I made in my journal, I carried the memory and understanding that India is a place of extremes, poverty and opulence, beauty and ugliness, kindness and cruelty. And these private notes can become the basis for shaping an essay about the uses and limits of travel photography, as well as about the nature of memory when it's expressed in snapshots. In other words, I can follow a map of my memories about India through the written account of my experiences and how I interpret that map will shape the truth of my encounters with the country and its people. Through an essay, my memories might also shape how other travelers come to perceive India's foreignness and its familiarity, either with or without a camera. Now, one way to turn my notes into the draft of an essay about India is to follow a two-part exercise I learned from a writer friend of mine named Bill Rohrbach. For years, Bill has taught people how to turn their memories, or as he puts it, what people are made out of, into the stuff of essays. Bill calls this exercise map making. It comes from a great book he wrote called Writing Life Stories. And while map making is a very evocative image, I think it's really an exercise that asks a writer to make what I would call a memory map. The directions are simple. First, I need to draw a literal map of the place I want to write about. That means I need to draw an actual map of one of the places I visit visited while I was in India. This might be a whole city, such as Lucknow, or it could be a map of a building, a park, or even just a room, such as a mosque, or a maidan, or a bathroom in a natural history museum. Now my map, it should be rough. There's no need to fuss about whether my perspective is completely accurate or whether I've put, th put things in exactly the right place. After making my sketch, I'm gonna fill in my map with notes about the memories I experienced in this place, writing them down in the margins. I'm also gonna jot down any smells, tastes, textures, or sounds that I can recall. Of course, I'll look back at my travel journal to help me recreate sense-based details from my time in India. Now, once I'm done drawing and annotating my map, part two of the exercise is for me to write a story out of this map. This story is the one that becomes the rough draft of my memory map essay. It's my first attempt at creating a map of my mind that shows something of how I experienced India. I have to say that I really like this metaphor of a map in thinking about human memory and how our memories work. Unlike a database or a photo album or a filing cabinet, a map is a dynamic combination of words and images. It charts a specific geography within a clear set of parameters. At the same time, a map also evolves over time. When a cartographer realizes that this or that feature needs to be expanded or reduced or changed altogether, it's time to make a new map. And since the purpose of a map is navigation, 
It calls out to its user. A map is meant to be explored. In this way, a map is a shared form, one in which the map maker and the reader co-create meaning together. I encourage you to consider making a map of the mind that is based on your own memories for each essay that you write. For there are many kinds of essays that are built around how a writer interprets and understands a certain place, a particular event, or a group of people. And as you remember these people, places, and things, as you write down your memories, certain points will be charted along the way. And these points, in turn, will then form an essay that encompasses your recollections and your interpretations of these memories. Okay, to offer you a concrete example of what I'm talking about, let's turn to a wonderful essay by Virginia Woolf called Street Haunting, A London Adventure. For Woolf, London is her city. It's her home. So this is a familiar landscape, a well-worn map. And yet she manages to turn London into a strange land and herself into a stranger exploring it. She does so by bringing together memory with imagination and deliberately shifting her perspective from that of a native to that of a visitor. Let me turn to Aristotle for a moment. What I'm talking about here is Wolf's narrative voice, or ethos. Ethos is the voice of a writer, one that the writer creates for the reader, a voice that must have credibility, conveying the writer's truth of an experience, rather than just the facts. Ethos is how an essayist understands herself, and it is also how she presents that self to others. And if the writer is credible, if she has strong ethos, then the reader will be willing to listen in order to hear what she has to say. The persuasive voice that Wolf creates in her essay Street Haunting is a strong example of how an essayist can build a credible ethos. So let's take a look more closely at how Wolf navigates her literal map of London against the mental map that she draws alongside it. And let's think more deeply about how Wolf generates a credible ethos along the way. On the one hand, Wolf traces an actual map of London, following a footpath along its streets from her home in Bloomsbury to an area called the Strand by the River Thames before she heads back home again. If a reader were to stick to the place names associated with Wolf's evening stroll, it would be easy to draw a map of her journey. This literal map provides a clear sense of where Wolf goes as she haunts the streets on a winter's evening. But in point of fact, very little of her essay is concerned with the places and people she passes or the real world events she encounters along the way. Instead, her essay is more about how she interprets these things. For Wolf is interested in how she imagines them and how they in turn imagine her, this flesh and blood person named Virginia Woolf, as well as this character, this narrator, who is also named Virginia Woolf. So another way to trace the map of Wolf's mind is to consider how it offers interior directions, a chart that isn't at all faithful to an actual London map. In the opening sentences of Street Haunting, Wolf says that she wants to go and buy a pencil, although she admits that this is only a pretext to indulge in what she sees as the greatest pleasure of town life in winter, rambling the streets of London. Before she ventures out into the twilight, though, Wolf first describes her own sitting room, a living space that defines and expresses her life. In other words, Wolf starts by showing herself to be a native, and she establishes her ethos, her narrative credibility, by talking about how well she knows the ins and outs of her own flat in Bloomsbury. In a place known by heart, such as a kitchen, an office, or a favorite restaurant, human memory is stamped by specific objects and architectural features. A butcher block inherited from a grandmother, a drawing pinned to a cubicle made by a young son, maybe a dark booth in a cozy back corner of a beloved bistro. For Wolf, one object that stamps her memory is a blue and white china bowl on the mantel above her fireplace. It brings to her mind a windy day in Mantua, Italy, 
when an old shopkeeper manipulated Wolf into buying the bowl. The shopkeeper thrust it into Wolf's hand and said, take it, adding that she would end up starving one of these days. The bowl always tells the exact same story. In Wolf's house, her memories are fixed, forever tied to her own narrow life. Wolf calls the memories that people associate with the places they go to every day, that kitchen, that office, that restaurant, as the shell-like coverings which our souls have excreted to house themselves. Yet once she steps out into the London night, Wolf adopts the ethos of a visitor, a stranger, and her metaphor for memory changes radically. Whereas before she thought of memories as a shell, now she imagines herself a central oyster of perceptiveness, an enormous eye. Taking a winter walk gives Wolf permission to lose herself and other people and places that are ever-changing and unfamiliar. As Wolf herself explains, the enormous eye floats us smoothly down a stream, resting, pausing, the brain sleeping, perhaps as it looks. And it is in this state of pure looking, of taking in your surroundings and losing yourself in the process, that Wolf draws a distinctly different kind of memory map. Once Wolf leaves her flat and shuts her front door, it's possible for us to stroll beside her along the pathways of her actual map, where Wolf first transforms a small city park called Russell Square into a field of English countryside. Now, this park is right around the corner from her home, but for a moment, Wolf thinks she's in the country with no buildings at all hearing those little cracklings and stirrings of leaf and twig, which seem to suppose the silence of fields all around, a hooting owl, and far away, the rattle of a train in the valley. By changing this urban park to a rural landscape, Wolf starts to alter her own perspective from that of a native to that of a visitor. Leaving Russell Square, Wolf turns south, along Oxford Street, which even today is still known for its rows and rows of shops. As she strides along, Wolf imagines herself in a boot shop, briefly jumping into the perspective of a dwarf woman trying on a pair of shoes while she admires her full-sized aristocratic feet in the mirror. Then, just as quickly, Wolf jumps back into herself and continues to move on down the street. She starts to window shop with no intention of buying anything. Looking at all of the clothes and furniture and jewelry for sale, she asks the enormous eye. She says the enormous eye is now sportive and generous. It creates, it adorns, it enhances. As she peers into the shop windows, Wolf builds up the rooms of an imaginary house with a sofa, a table, and a carpet. And just as quickly, she dismantles them again, under no obligation to live in this house or that one. Wolf's delight is not so different from the fun of watching HGTV, dreaming about a kitchen or bath renovation, or thinking about how to design a vegetable garden. Wolf then glances into a jewelry shop and admires a string of antique pearls. And this very moment that she imagines herself putting the pearls on, Wolf starts to live another life, a life contained entirely within her mind. In her reverie, Wolf fancies that it's a much, much later hour, between three and four in the morning, and that she's at a party in Mayfair at a wealthy London district a long ways from Oxford Street. Wearing pearls, wearing silk, Wolf says, one steps out to a balcony which overlooks the gardens of sleeping Mayfair. A cat creeps along the garden wall. Lovemaking is going on seductively in the darker places of the room behind thick green curtains. The aged prime minister recounts to Lady So-and-so with the curls and the emeralds the true history of some great crisis in the affairs of the land. Of course, this moment has its reality TV appeal, especially the slipperiness between fact and fiction that transforms an ordinary life into one that's extraordinary. In this case, a life spent flirting with the prime minister in the wee small hours of the morning. So once again, Wolf is like a visitor within her own city. She intensifies this idea when she reminds herself, 
But what could be more absurd? It is, in fact, on the stroke of six. It is a winter's evening. We are walking to the Strand to buy a pencil. From here, then, Wolf makes her way to the River Thames before finally arriving at the stationer's shop in the Strand, a shop that sells pencils. After witnessing an argument between the shopkeeper and his wife, Wolf buys her pencil, which, of course, is a symbol of her writing, and then heads back to her own flat in Bloomsbury. Upon her arrival, she says, Here again is the usual door. Here the chair turned as we left it, and that china bowl on the mantelpiece. Wolf's evening ramble has come full circle, and she is once again enclosed inside her own shell. Okay, so what can a modern-day essayist learn from Wolf's ramble about London? The way that Wolf sheds her individual private self to take on a wider perspective is one that's crucial for any essayist. Wolf moves from the shell to the enormous eye, from being curled up inside her own memories and experiences to taking in the sights of the wide, wide world around her. And all essayists should learn how to transform personal memories into public ideas if they hope to make points that are re relevant to others. So just as I witness suffering and hunger in India, Wolf steps out of herself to observe what is strange and familiar within just a few steps of her flat in London. Returning to Wolf's essay for just a minute, let's go back to that scene where she jumps into the mind of the dwarf woman in the boot shop. After this scene, Wolf's vision changes abruptly. Up to this point, all she saw was beauty. But now her enormous eye fixes on nothing but the humped, the twisted, and the deformed. This profound change of mood allows Wolf to look more deeply beyond the attractive shop windows into the shadows where London's destitute population lives. Wolf traces this deeper map to excite empathy on the part of her reader. It's a way in which her impressionistic essay becomes one with sharp political points. But there is a second lesson here as well. Wolf demonstrates that chronological time, as we live it day to day, is not the way humans experience memory, nor the way essays have to be structured. After she tells herself that it's absurd to think she's on a balcony wearing pearls in June, Wolf comes back to her physical reality, standing on a cold, dark street in winter. In doing so, Wolf actually collapses that classic split between body and mind playing with an idea that Toni Morrison has defined as re-memory. In Toni Morrison's novel, Beloved, a character named Setha explains re-memory in this way. If a house burns down, it's gone. But the place, the picture of it, stays. And not just in my re-memory, but out there in the world. In essence, Wolf and Morrison both demonstrate to writers how pictures in the mind create their own places and spaces. This radical notion gives imagination an incredible power, suggesting that the way a writer sees and rememories those sites through an essay can change the concrete world beyond the words. Now, perhaps the most obvious way a flesh and blood change might be made by the words within an essay is in the body and mind of a reader, who sees and experiences and then remembers the world differently as a result of having read a provocative essay. And to get your readers to change how they see the world, of course, you have to think carefully about the choices you make as you craft your essays. All writers are choice makers. Once Wolf makes certain choices to show her reader an imaginative view of London, she can't make contradictory or otherwise distracting choices after that. For instance, she can't switch midway through her essay to the kind of narrative voice found in an architecture textbook on central London from the 1930s. So when essayists create an ethos or their narrative voices, they do so deliberately to influence or affect their readers in a certain way. Different words, a different organization, a different focus would make the ethos of Wolf's street haunting something else entirely. Instead of meandering and fantastic, a kind of dream vision ethos, Wolf might have adopted 
a scientific ethos, a sentimental one, an activist one, maybe even an environmental one. Regardless of the kind of voice an essayist creates, the writer must adopt a strong ethos through this voice, saying to the reader, what I write to you is my truth, my bond. On the other hand, if a writer makes false claims or outright lies to a reader, then credibility is lost, and the writer's voice actually detracts from the writing, from the believability of the essay and the reader's investment in it. Okay, so now it's time to bring together all of these concepts, ethos, memory, imagination, and how to map a sense of place that's both literal, but also of the mind. It's time to write your own memory map. As I suggested before, when I was thinking about how I might turn my own notes on my trip to India into a full essay, you can start by drawing a concrete map of a specific place, a place you recollect from your own past, one that means something to you. This map might be a geography that you remember from when you were a child, a teenager, or a young adult. It could be a neighborhood, a schoolyard, a building, a room, or maybe an imaginary world in the woods behind your childhood home. It might be the geography of a foreign place you once visited, like when I went to India. Or it could be the neighborhood where you live right now, just like Wolf's Bloomsbury. The most important thing is that you should be able to draw the place in concrete terms. So it shouldn't be an imaginary place, like a fantasy kingdom. It should be a place that actually exists. Now, if you want to use north-south coordinates and color-coded lines for streets and paths, go ahead and do so. Such professional touches are not required. Do make sure, though, to include as much detail as you can. And once you're done with your visual map, list in the margins physical features of the space and qualities you remember about the people who spend time there. Be descriptive. Be tactile. Move beyond the memories contained within sight to those of sound, taste, touch, and smell. If you're writing about a sunset, then don't just talk about its vibrant orange hues or its popcorn clouds. Imagine what it would be like to touch the sunset, even to taste it. India became more vivid and complex to me when I translated its sights to other senses into imagery. As with the mother's holding babies against their chests, begging for money, moving hands to their mouths over and over again, eating air. Also feel free to use your imagination. If you can't remember the exact facts of the people or place, just as I can't remember the color of the Ganges, then remember the truth of them, meaning the emotions and the ideas of them. Once you've finished your visual map, then write a story out of it, either from a small corner of the map or from the whole. Don't edit yourself too much. Don't try for anything perfect or polished. Instead, your job is to get your ideas down, to brainstorm, take notes, or do whatever else you need to turn a white page or a blank computer screen into a first draft of an essay. Your story need not be long, but keep going if you're on a roll. And in the end, your memory map and the story that will come out of it will be a first go at taking the stuff of your life, your recollections, and turning them into a credible and compelling essay. It will be your first attempt at re your experience into a kind of truth of the human. <laughs>